John chapter 3. You know, when you speak about love, it has been so diluted and tainted by the world's definition of love. If you love what I love, I love you. That's pretty much how it works, isn't it? If you love what I love, I love you. If you don't love me uh, and my way, then you're hateful, spiteful, and everything else. But I am so glad I've got the Word of God and I know Jesus Christ personally as my Savior because I can say His love is not one-sided or is it ever been hinged on what we do for Him. It's not. We didn't have to become a good person for God to save us, did we? No. God so loved us while we were yet sinners. <laughs> That's somebody not even in the sphere of God. He died for us. And this is the great thing about this message. I think our world needs to hear more of the power of love. Not a one-sided love. Not a selfish love. But a sacrificial love. The love of Jesus Christ. And you know... John chapter 3 is probably the greatest place to start about the love of Christ. Here is Nicodemus, a rich ruler, a Pharisee, knew the law, practiced the law, did the law, but he was missing something. Amen? We've all been there. If you are a born-again Christian today, you know what it was like. And then one day, God showed you what it was really like. Amen? You know, many of us have been in churches. But we really didn't know what church was until we found Christ. Many of us grew up in Christian homes. Some of us didn't. Some of us even tried to do Christianity. But nothing changed. Until we called upon the name of the Lord. And as he says in Romans chapter 10, Whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what a difference Yes, we have our battles, but it seems there is more of a ability and a desire to serve than we've ever had. A desire to grow and a desire to learn. And this book is attached to our hand. We can't put it down. 
There is a difference. There's a hunger. And the Bible says that we hunger and thirst after righteousness. As I want to look at uh, this morning, I want us to turn our attention to John chapter 3. I want us to see the gospel goal is to demonstrate the overwhelming love of Christ to all people. Overwhelming love of Christ to all people. This is something I want you to see. I want you to see the heart of God beginning in chapter four, uh, 3 in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Somebody that does not want to change does not want Christianity. I was reading an article this week, and a, a group here in Canada is talking about total abolition of religion of any form. And they want to begin a political party on this manifest because he said none of the political parties have the backbone to push a total religious free society well that sounds like the end times they can have their total religious free society but let me listen to that for that trumpet sound but what they need is I guarantee you if they didn't find religion but found a relationship it would truly change their life there's religion out there but it is dead as this pulpit is it's wood. It's hollow. It's works. It's idolatry. But nothing to do with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we know when Nicodemus went from a religious institution, being a Pharisee, to a believer, what a difference it made in his life. Same way with Joseph of Arimathea, another Pharisee. So did it happened in many lives. And I want you to turn your attention this morning to all the scriptures we'll be learning about different people that the power of love conquered and brought to Christ. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege to be able to open thy word that has sustained the, the disdain of Satan all these years. That is been burnt, torn up, cast away, and yet it is still here today. And we can open up to John 3 and see the condition of the world that evil hateth the light. But those that truly are seeking will be converted with the power of love. The love of God who loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For we know the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being willing to come to the cross to die for our sins. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, a real personal relationship, let this be the morning, as Corinthians says, the day of salvation. Or any online, Lord, we pray or those that will watch this week, work in their hearts to see that we are not guaranteed tomorrow, but the plan of salvation is here today, this moment, this time. In Jesus' precious name, amen. As we look at the gospel goal, the goal of Satan and his schemes has been to dilute the gospel, has been to distract from the gospel, it has been to try to uh, 
do away with the gospel. Look how many times throughout history that people were martyred trying to translate the Bible into English. Look how many times churches, even today, are being attacked, are being burnt, are being martyred. We do not hear all that happens in Africa in Muslim countries to Christian churches. People are being shut up in their churches even this last month and burn alive because of their faith. But the news is silent. If all lives matter, folks, that's 200 souls that died in northern Africa this last month. Burnt for their faith. How about other countries? But you know what? I love when villages and people testify that whenever Satan tries to stamp them out, it just burns the fires hotter. And I am glad that the power of love always is victorious. The power of Christ's love will save anyone. I was sharing the other day, talking to someone, they were confusing God's wrath and love. And I said, God's wrath is because you rejected a very precious gift from Him. And I said, He did not come in to condemn the world, but the world through Him might be saved. Well, why would He send someone to hell, He said. I said, He doesn't. Get that through your head. He made hell for the devil and his angels. I said, right now, you're refusing his gift. And I brought out the old Christmas illustration. I says, and I pulled my watch off. I says, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. I said, but how would you feel if I said, no, thank you. I don't want your gift. He said, well, I'd be kind of ticked. I said, touche. How do you think God feels? You didn't give your son... To die on the cross for all of man's sin no matter how bad they are. And you basically rejected his precious gift. And you rejected a gift of eternal life. I says, that doesn't take a rocket scientist to say that was a poor choice. So if you're not accepting the gift of eternal life, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. You're automatically going there. Well, I disagree. I said, you can disagree all you want. The facts are the facts. And this is where people are. If you do not accept him, if you do not confess, the Bible says, if you accept you repent, you will likewise perish. Except ye repent. You. It doesn't have anything to do with God. He's given you the dinner. He's given you the grace. He's given you the mercy. He's given you everything you need. He set up the table. He used an illustration about setting up a table and inviting the people in. Oh, I'm sorry, I just got married. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got to go try out a bunch of cows. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got to go to this. There's a free dinner. <laughs> Who doesn't like a free dinner? Here is eternal life. Here is home in heaven for all of eternity. And here is hell. So don't tell me there's not a choice there. You say yes or no. And this is where Nicodemus comes in. And I want you to see that the gospel, the power of love, is to the educated and religious. Sometimes, my father-in-law says we're educated beyond our intelligence. And it's true. People want to, ed with their educated knowledge, explain away the gospel. And it is so simple. Look, Jesus did not call 12 brains. <laughs> That's very apparent. He calls Simon the Zealot, Thomas the Doubter, uh, the fisherman boys, um, and a tax collector to boot. Now, this ought to have been really fun. Can you imagine Simon the Zealot, who was fighting the Roman Inquisitions? And we have Matthew, who is working for the Romans, getting the taxes. Oh, that ought to have been really good dinner conversations. And then you had Peter, who just said anything and everything he wanted. And then you had Thomas, mm, I don't know. About that. And then you had... Good old Judas, just shut up and give me the money. That's all that matters. Just put it in my pocket. Wow. And that's who Christ chose to turn the world upside down. And this is where, when he chooses us, what a grace, what mercy, what love for us to go. But as you look in John chapter 3 and verse 1, 
I want you to see how he acts, how he teaches this person who is a teacher about what he really needs. And he said, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So not only was he religious, but he was educated. He was a ruler. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man could do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. In other words, he's not quite ready to accept that he is the son of God. He just, you're a good teacher, Rabbi. You can do great miracles and you're sent of God and God's with you, but you're not God. Jesus answered and said to him very clearly, look at this. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Boy, Nicodemus still couldn't wrap his head around this. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter in the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Here he is using his educated knowledge to try to rationalize being spiritually born. How am I to go back into my mom's belly? She's probably passed away by now. How is this going to work? But notice what Jesus says. Jesus answered. Notice how he answered. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. What is the water here? Ephesians talks about the washing of the water and the regeneration of the word. The word of God is always referring to as the water. When you see something here and you notice what he's saying, the spirit, the Holy Spirit has to do the conviction and the drawing. And this is where you notice God's word is very clear. And he says, except a man be born. Except a man be born again. He's given him two illustrations that, what does it say? Except a man hears the word of God and a doer of the word. He keeps talking about the word, the word, the word. Who is the word? John 1.1. 1, 1, he is the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. You look back in the beginning of the time and God spoke Who's the word? Jesus Christ. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? He still can't grasp it. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? How can you know the word of God and teach other people, yet you don't know this? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. You're still not getting it. And so he goes in to telling him, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? What a question for an educated person. How are you going to understand it? If you can't understand the working of the human things, how can you understand the working of the spiritual things? And as we that the gospel is there to the educated and the religious. Paul, time and time again, spoke to the educated. He spoke to the religious. And his message was the same. God Love will save anyone. Do you notice the Pharisees were pricked in the heart every time they heard Christ speak? Why? Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. They did not want to be exposed. Even Christ said that the religious were as whited sepulchers. Looking really good and painted on the outside, but what's inside? A sepulcher is a tomb. Dead bodies, rotting corpses. And that's what he said the Pharisees were. When we do not have the power of love from the inside out, in other words, we're not saved, we can put on, as one of my old professors says, you can put lipstick on a pig and it's still a pig. You know, the thing is, we can look great every time in all the years I've had animals, everybody knows you wash a dog, a cat, anybody else, and where do they go? They go to the dirt right afterwards. It's like, I just, why bathe them? 
No matter what animal you have, they love the dirt. You can't change what's on the inside. It's nature for them. And this is where we have to see that we can do all we can. We always hear the same mantra every January 1st. Turn over a new leaf. Well, you can turn the leaf over you want all you want, but you can't turn it over off a tree without it dying. Can you ever turn a leaf over on a tree when it's attached? No. But they always show a leaf by itself and turning one over. And I'm thinking, it's going to die as soon as it hits the sun on the other side because it doesn't have any fluids coming through it. And if we are not a part of the vine, if we're not, as John 15 says, if we're not a part of the vine, which is Christ, how are we going to live? We're not. We're just going to be turning from one side to another until it's dead. But as John 3 says, that the gospel is there even to the educated and religious. We have a lot of educated people in our country and in the world that want to dispute the facts of the gospel. They're so educated, they're believing that we came from a salamander or a big bang or a monkey or something else. I have to laugh. It takes greater faith to believe that than it does that God spoke the world in existence. I always ask a guy every time he says, well, why do we still have apes then? Well, you know, but, you know, um, they, they try to explain the way how we still have apes. But if we've evolved, why is there still apes? Why is there still salamanders? They can't explain that one. Second of all, I want you to see that the gospel is there to the hateful. We have a lot of gospel haters today. But you know what? That's no different. They hated Christ. They hated him. They hated him so bad in Luke chapter 23, they demanded that they release a convicted murderer over someone that walked in their midst, healed the sick, cast out demons of those that were oppressed, healed the blind men, healed the dumb, raised the dead to life, gave them food, and they said, crucify him. And they weren't happy unless he was beaten and mutilated. And then they mocked him at the foot of the cross and said, If you be the Son of God, then get yourself down. If that's not hate, I don't know what is. And we are seeing hate just like he saw hate. People, like I mentioned, the church being burnt down. That's not the first in this year. It's been several. How many Christians have been put together, put to death, gathered together and thrown in prison and martyred over the centuries and millenniums for their faith? The hate. Why? Evil hateth the light. And in chapter 23, 17 and 23, 17 through 23, the Bible says, make sure I got it right um, for of necessity we must release one of them at the feast and they cried out all at once saying away with this man and release unto us Barabbas who for certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison Pilate therefore willing to release Jesus spake again to them but they cried saying crucify him crucify him and he said unto them the third time, Why, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief, the chief priest prevailed. The more Pilate was saying, He's not guilty. We don't care. Kill him. Give us this man that was treasonous and murderous. We'll take him. The very people that probably turned this man Barabbas in is asking him to be released and changed of Jesus. Wow. Mark chapter 15, please. Mark chapter 15. Notice...
Mark chapter 15, verse 11 through 15. But the chief priests moved the people that they, he should release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said it again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why ha What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceeding, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to contend the content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Hate-filled. But turn back to Luke chapter 23 and look at verse 34. This is the only gospel that records these precious words from our Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Aren't you glad the Lord Jesus Christ looked up from that cross to his Father and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If that is not unconditional love, I don't know what is. To look at somebody that has demanded your murder, demanded you put to death, and was not even satisfied when the Roman officials beat you beyond recognition, they still wanted his blood and his death. Evil, hate-filled people. And yet Jesus looks down and says, Father, forgive them. Don't hold it to them. They don't know what they're doing. If it was the love of the world, we already see what people do when they get in their mob mentality. But you know what Jesus said? It was against me. It was against me. But I'm here for you. Father, forgive them. His gospel still prevailed. Because even at that cross, and centurion looks up, that no doubt was in charge of the soldiers over the execution. He oversaw, oversaw everything, including the nailing and the placing the cross in the hole. And he said, truly, this is the Son of God. Through it all, one saw that this was the Son of God and gave his heart at the foot of the cross. But thousands of years later, many in this sanctuary have bowed at the same cross. We may not have been able to bend in Israel, but we bowed our heart and our head and say, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. Would you come and be my Savior? The power of love is still changing the educated and religious. It's still changing the hate-filled mobs. But also, in John chapter 4, it's still changing the outcast and the unwanted. I'm so glad that even today, I've had the privilege at Community Baptist of leading some outcasts to the Lord. I'm excited that God is still in the saving business no matter what, and no matter where, and no matter who. In John chapter 4, and verse 6, and the Bible says, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, sat thus on the well. It was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Here's the whole picture of it. Ladies did not get water around noon. Unless you were an outcast and unwanted. They, draw, they drew water in the morning early it wasn't hot they gave their crops they gave their animals water in the morning but this woman was not welcome at the well when the other women were there this woman was not welcome in the evening time she had to come in the hottest part of the day because she was outcast and unwanted because she had been married four times and the guy she was now was not married so how many home, basically we would call her a home wrecker. She was not welcome. But Jesus 
I love how he says, I must needs go through Samaria. Here's Jerusalem, here's Judea, and Samaria is over here. Wait a minute. He could have gone straight down from Jerusalem to Judea or straight up, but he had to go make a detour. Why? Because there was a woman at the well that needed love. There was a woman that was outcast and unwanted. And it's sad when even churches today pick and choose who they want to worship with. I've seen it, and it is sad. And you know, it's even been interesting, even in the older part of our community's history, we had a family that wasn't really happy that another family was attending. And you know, I told them one word, tough. <laughs> I'm not worried about it. Well, you know, what are we attracting? I'm attracting sinners. How about you? This is the problem. Even Christians or people that attend church are prejudiced. They don't want those times. And our last church was right on the corner of Ritson and Beatty, right next to Olive Street, the bad part of Olive Street. And we had people coming in. It didn't matter. Why? Because they need the gospel. We had a Thursday morning at one time, coffee time, and people would stop in. And we had a lot of people that were on the street come in and get a free cup of coffee and we were able to share the gospel with them. And you know, I'll be honest. Your flesh goes, how do you get that smell out of your church? They hadn't taken a bath in a while. But you know what? After a while, it just kind of dissipates because you realize that's a soul sitting there. That the devil has addicted to drugs and alcohol and prostitution and anything else. They need Christ. That's what our world needs. We don't need to say, well, I don't want them. Look how many people Jesus met that Mary Magdalene, demon to possess and a prostitute. We see time and time again, God met, God's son met people that were undesirable. And he loved them all the same. That's what we need to have, the heart of God in us doesn't matter what they look like on the outside. It's the heart on the inside that matters. If you ever read the autobiography of William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, it will stir your heart. I had to read it for a college paper, and I forgot what a phenomenal man William Booth was. He, his church says, no, we don't want the slums of London in our church so he left the church and began a outreach ministry and started his own church and he called it the Salvation Army you know you look at it he said is the gospel not good enough for them they're dying in the shadow of the steeple and you don't care we need to realize that God loves the educated and the religious. God loves those that are hateful toward him. God loves the outcast and the unwanted. But he also loves, in Luke chapter 18, the forgotten and the derelict. Whenever time I read this story, I think about the power of the cross. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 38 and verse 39, Here's a man, blind, sitting on the side of the road, begging. And as Jesus was walking by Jericho, notice what the Bible says, is a certain blind man sat by the way, begging. Drawing the picture here. And he cried, saying in verse 38, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which were with, they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You know what the people, the religious people following David, shush. Following Jesus, shush, be quiet. 
But I'm glad when you're yearning for the love of Jesus Christ and when you know He could change your life, He cried all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Shush, be quiet. Don't bother Him. The Master's too busy for you. I am glad that Jesus Christ is never too busy for anyone. I'm glad Jesus Christ will always save the forgotten and the derelict. Years ago, I had the privilege of going to Alto State Prison in Georgia. And you know, it's never a good thing when you've never been behind bars to hear those clunk, clunk of the gates behind you and the guards saying, all secure, and you're on the inside. And then they bring all the inmates out for the service. And you know what's great? Is you see the inmates that can never get out for the rest of their lives have committed heinous crimes, testifying how Jesus saved them on the inside. That they are serving their dues to community because of the things they did, but they're so glad that they are released on the inside. It didn't matter the color, the age, the race, there was everybody in that common room singing how great thou art, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I will never forget one of them as one of the Rockers of Ages chaplains was preaching. There was an older black man, probably mid six foot, just standing up during the song, Amazing Grace, with tears just streaming down his face. He was a convicted murderer. And he was just saying, I'm so glad that God saved a wretch like me. Someone came to his cell and presented him the gospel. And he got saved. The forgotten and the derelict, they're in prison, they don't matter. Yes, they do. God still loves them just as much as he loves us. But also, we want to see that he loves the imprisoned. Think about the man that was in chains. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3 and 4, Matthew chapter 5 and 3 and 4. This man here, no one knew what to do with him. He was filled with demons. They chained him. He broke his chains. He was in caves. And the thing about it was when Jesus cast out the demons, they went in the swine. And of all things, this story just makes me laugh. The townspeople are more furious about losing their swine, which Jews were not supposed to raise, than the man that was redeemed. Sitting at Jesus, clothed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in the right mind, and they were scared of him. Doesn't that paint a picture? You're not scared of a lunatic running around naked with chains, screaming, but you're scared of him clothed in his right mind. Hello? Somebody home upstairs? You want to think, what does our world come to? Who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him? No, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Look what the Bible says. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. He was possessed. But when Jesus came, they, verse 15, they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to them. To him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. Get out of here. Please get, leave. Wow. What could have helped their community 
the love of Christ and the transformation of his love, they asked him to leave. What has our country done over the last 40 years? Let's take prayer out of school. Let's take the words, God save the queen out. Let's change, alter our, anything we can that says God. Let's take it off our Ten Commandments, off our courtroom walls. Let's chisel monuments that have anything with God away. Let's remove him. When God can change our nation and can change the hearts of this, those, let's build more community centers. Let's get rid of more churches. Folks, community centers are not going to change people's hearts. But the love of Jesus Christ. It's going to change the educated and the religious. It's going to change those that are hated, outcast, and unwanted, forgotten and derelict, and imprisoned. We need more preachers that share the gospel, preach the gospel. We need more church members that are witnesses all around the world. But you know what? God even loves the worst of nations. Jonah chapter 1. Jonah, if you ever read any history on the country of Nineveh, they were vile. The things that they did for sport to conquering nations is unimaginable. They were known for atrocities that you and I could not even imagine. How could a human being do that to another human being? Some historians say that Jonah was actually the part of Israel that he was at would have probably been under Ninevites rule at one time so when the Lord Jesus Christ came to Jonah and says I want you to go to Nineveh and do this arise and go to Nineveh in verse 1 that great city and cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me arise go to Nineveh that great city and cry against it for their wickedness has come. it was so bad it got God's attention front and center he says Jonah I want you to go there Jonah goes See you, Lord. I think there's a ship going to Tarshish, and I'm going the other way. God says, okay. I'm going to send a great whale, a fish, as he calls it here. Matthew says a whale. We know it was pretty big because he got to swallow a man. He's going to track your boat, and then we're going to send a storm, and then we're going to see how long you last. The problem is, Christians, when God has a purpose for us and he picks us to do it, we're the very best that he wants to carry that goal. He didn't pick anybody else. He picked Jonah. A person that more than likely, if the historians are correct, that had animosity greatly, unforgiveness toward this nation. Because we know that from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, he wasn't real happy when they did repent. He was not happy that they did. But you know what the Bible says? And the word of the Lord in chapter 3, in verse 1, came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, the great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. You know what the Bible says? He came, went to and from the entire city. And the people of Nineveh, in verse 5, believed God. They were ripe. And God knew that. And he chose Jonah to be the messenger. They needed the love of Christ just as any other nation did. We may look around and we say, man, I read an article years ago and it broke my heart. As much as we did not as Canadians like what ISIS was doing to the world. I read articles of Christianity says they all need to die. Oh, my flesh thought so. 
But didn't they need the Lord too? Will they accept the Lord? I don't know. How would you know without a... But a year ago, I read an article from a missionary in Iraq. He is an Iraqi. He was there. He saw what they did to Nineveh. He saw, I mean, um, one of the cities, I'm trying to think of the name of it there. Anyway, I think it was Nineveh. There was a couple other cities there that were predominantly Christian that were martyred by ISIS. But because of the faith of some of the Christians that were being martyred, two of the main soldiers in ISIS in that area accepted Christ as their personal Savior. Because they realized their death was different than the death of those Christians. There's something about when a Christian dies, they're moving on home. There's not a fear. There's not a clamoring. But Christians... The power of love. But you know what one of the ISIS fighters said? They said, we forgive you. And he said, I never got over that. He said, when someone kills one of us, we want revenge. We want more blood. But they said, we forgive you. And God loves you. And died for you. He said, Allah wants blood. Your God wants forgiveness. And that's what he could not get away, the power of love. We forgive you. God loves you. What did Jesus Christ do on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The worst of the nations. But think about John chapter 8 and verse 3. The gospel is to those that are silenced. This woman was caught in adultery more or less an entrapment. And she was brought before with no voice, as women did not have voice back then. They brought before Jesus and said, Master, doesn't the law say that she should be stoned to death because she committed adultery? And he threw her at the feet of Jesus. She had no voice. She was silent. Shush. You're a nobody. You're a disgrace. You know what Jesus said? John chapter 8, beginning in verse 3. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery when they had set her in the midst. And they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. See a stage? How'd they know she was in the very act if it wasn't planned? They were waiting to catch Jesus. And I love while Jesus reaches down in the middle and he says we don't know what he says he said he stooped down and wrote in the ground I want to think that he started writing their names down and what they did because the Bible says and they in verse 9 which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one beginning at the eldest and unto the last and Jesus was left alone with a woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine, those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Here's a woman caught in adultery. This is where I tell people, they try to trap me all the time and say, well, you hate this group of people, you hate that group. I says, Jesus never hated the sinner, he hated the sin. And likewise, I don't hate the people, I hate the sin. It's wrong. It's a blot against God. Where are thine accusers? Nowhere, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. In other words, leave your sinful lifestyle. Don't do it anymore. The silenced. But in Luke chapter 18 and verse 13, he's even there for the humble. There are those that know just what type of person they are. And God's still there for them. 
When we have the realization, as we know, the great prayer of the Pharisees, Oh, I'm glad I'm not like this person. I give my tithes, I fast, I do this, and pff, we're not like this publican over here. Publican says, look with me in verse 13. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote un upon his breath, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He couldn't even look up at heaven and said, God, be merciful me, merciful to me. I'm a sinner. God's love will save them as well. Those that realize already, I'm nothing but a worthless sinner. What did Paul say? I'm the chiefest of sinners. He'll save them. But the Lord Jesus will also save the proud. Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. There are a lot of proud people in this world that think they need nothing. But they need the Lord. Amen. To the proud. Daniel chapter 4 verse 30 and 37. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Wow, here's Nebuchadnezzar. It's all mine. I did it. This is me. Look at me. Look at my power. Look at my nation. Look at this. It's all me. God says, that's it. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. As you have spoken it, your dream has come true. The one that you had Daniel interpret. So for seven years, he crawls around as a beast, eating grass. His hair grows long. His nails grow long. I remember in one of my college classes we were talking about prophecy and this was being read. And I said, wouldn't you love to have guard duty on that? Who's watching the crazy king today? <laughs> he's going around eating grass. You know, he still was king. He had to have guard duty. Boy, wouldn't you love to draw the short straw on that one? But after seven years, look what the Bible says in verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. What a transformation. He humbled me. He's the God of heaven. It's all his works. Everything is his. And I extol him and honor him. If God can save King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the world, the prideful, what can he do for us? As I said this morning, pray for our leaders. Because he could save Justin Trudeau and anyone else. Doug Ford, if they don't know Jesus Christ, their personal savior. He can save anyone. And he would love to. Time is short. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. In 2 Peter 3 9. He's coming to seek and to save that which is lost in Luke 9 56 and Matthew 18 11. Proverbs 27 1 said, Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Don't brag that tomorrow is going to be here because we just don't know. James chapter 4 says, Our life is as a vapor. Every time. We burnt wood. And on a cool day, I'd love to go out and just watch the smoke come out of our chimney. Smell it, see it, and after a while, it dissipate. That's our life. Gone. We may have 60, 80, 90, 100 years here. We may have 20. We don't know. But are we living our fullest for Jesus Christ? But if we don't know Jesus Christ, what point is life? 
The Bible says if we gained our whole world, yet lose our soul. You may have everything you ever wanted, but if you don't have Jesus Christ, we have nothing. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. The power of love can change the educated and religious, the outcast and the unwanted, the hateful, the forgotten and the derelict, the imprisoned, the worst of all nations, the silenced, the humble, and the proud. And he can make them, as the Bible says in Peter, saints of the living God. I don't have to do three miracles to become a saint. I just have to confess and accept Jesus Christ, my personal Savior. What a day that will be, as Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord forevermore. One day, my time on earth will be done. I don't want to be marked about all good that I did or bad that I did. One thing I want people to know is what happened on December 1978. I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. I haven't always lived for the Lord Jesus Christ as I should. But I'm thankful God is the God of mercy and forgiveness. And His plan was still intact. Even though I ran from it, did not want to do it, He still, like Jonah, had the whale right behind me, ready to take me where He needed me to fulfill the calling He had in my life. What is God's plan for your life? First of all, He's not willing that any should perish. He wants you to be a child of His. It is something we can never, ever explain. And it's the peace that passes all understanding. We can easily say to others, I can't explain it, but I'd sure for you, love for you to experience it. Because you can't explain to a lost person what it does, how it changes your life, how it gives you a new purpose, a new desire, until they experience it. If you have not experienced the love of Jesus Christ in a real and personal way, this is the morning too. If you have, this is the morning to share it. Time is short. The power of love can transform anyone that will let it. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege, the honor, and the joy of knowing Jesus Christ, our personal Savior. But Lord, I cannot take for granted that everyone even sitting here or in the sound of my voice online truly knows or has given their heart completely to Jesus Christ. There may be someone that believes, but has never accepted. Let this be the morning that they call out, as the publican said, I'm a sinner. Father, forgive me. Lord, thank you for each and every one here. Thank you for each and every one online. Would you work in hearts this morning? Would you stir us to be the witnesses we need to be? And Lord, would you save those that call upon your name and give them the peace that they long for, the hope that they so need, and the assurance of a home in heaven. Thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. Work in our hearts, O Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much for being here at Community this morning. Looking forward to seeing each and every one tonight at 6 o'clock as we preach on the schemes of Satan. Lord bless and have a great week.